Caught just nine days into the Second Boer War, the Battle of Talana Hill had all the hallmarks of a tragic comedy. British cavalry getting lost in the mist and then getting captured by Irish soldiers fighting for the Boers. British infantry under a barrage of friendly fire which killed their colonel. And a general who accused the Boers of impudence for disrupting his breakfast and starting a battle. And a hollow victory that somehow resulted in the victorious British being forced to into a full-blown 40-mile retreat just two days later. Welcome to yet another story from the Boer War, the Battle of Talana Hill, 1899. The Boer War was fought from 1899 to 1902 in South Africa between the British Empire and the Afrikaner Boer Republics of Transvaal and the Orange Free State. For Britain, it was the biggest military entanglement that had between the Crimean War and World War I. It cost the lives of 26,000 British and Imperial soldiers, including those from Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and 6,000 Boer fighters. A further 26,000 Boer civilians would die in British concentration camps, along with nearly 20,000 black Africans. Relations between the two sides had been deteriorating ever since the Boers had confirmed their independence in a short, victorious war with the British back in 1881. The culmination of that war saw a British army under General Coley defeated by the Boers under General Piet Joubert at the Battle of Majuba. In the intervening years, gold had been found near Johannesburg in Transvaal, and the ensuing gold rush had brought fortune hunters from all around the world to the Boer Republic. The Boers referred to them as Wheatlanders, outsiders. The Boers, concerned that they would become a minority in their own lands, denied the Wheatlanders the vote, fearing that as the majority of them were British, they would end up by default back in the British Empire. Which wasn't an altogether paranoid thought, because British imperialists, not least Cecil Rhodes, cast their eyes on the two republics and their gold reserves. In fact, in 1896, Rhodes had even funded an attempted coup in the Transvaal, in which his own private police force had invaded the country in what was known as the Jameson Raid. Stick with me and I will share a link to my video on that invasion, the Jameson Raid, later on. As tensions grew, the victor of Majuba, General Piet Joubert, was sent to Europe to purchase the latest weaponry that Europe had to offer. Something that, with the world's richest gold mines, the Transvaal could readily afford. And he returned with 30,000 smokeless Mauser magazine rifles, plus the latest artillery from both France and Germany. If the British were going to invade, they were going to face an enemy better equipped than the those they had faced in their more recent colonial battles, for instance at the Bottle of Omdurman in Sudan. With this new weaponry and the ability to raise a 40,000 strong civilian army in about two weeks, President Kruger was keen to strike a preemptive blow against the British Empire. A lightning attack capturing the port of Durban in the British colony of Natal would prevent British troops landing and indeed could embolden the Afrikaners living in the British Cape Colony to then rise in revolt. Kruger's hawkish position was not supported by all Boers. Piet Joubert was more conciliatory towards the British, as was President Steyn of the Boer Republic of the Orange Free State. It was only when the British government in September 1899 decided to send 8,000 reinforcements to South Africa, fearing a Boer attack, that Steen, Joubert and others became concerned that it might be the British who would strike first, and so they swung behind Kruger's strategy. On the 9th of October, as British troops began to land in Durban, Kruger issued an ultimatum. Either the British were to withdraw troops from his borders and turn back all reinforcements within 48 hours, or he would declare war. Two days later, with no response from the British, the two Boer republics declared war. The Second Anglo-Boer War, also called the South African War, had begun. As promised, the Boers crossed the border into British Natal, once more being led by General Piet Joubert, the victor of Majuba. In the small town of Dundee, in Natal's coalfields, Lieutenant General Penn Simmons waited in anticipation with his force of nearly 4,000 British soldiers. Lieutenant General Sir William Penn Simmons was a 66-year-old from Cornwall. Commissioned into the 24th Regiment of Foot in 1863, he'd served in the Zulu War and had only avoided the massacre of his regiment at Isandwana because he'd been pulled away on a special assignment. 
A stellar military career had seen him on active service in India and Burma until, in May 1899, he'd been appointed General Officer Commanding in Natal. Before he was later superseded by General Sir George White in September, he'd moved 4,000 of his men from Ladysmith, about 40 miles north, to Dundee. And that is where we find him on the 20th of October, 1899, the day of the First Battle of the Second Boer War. His army consisted of four infantry battalions, the 2nd Royal Dublin Fusiliers, the 1st Royal Irish Fusiliers, the 1st Leicesters, and the King's Royal Rifles, who, as the 60th Regiment of Foot, had borne the brunt of casualties all those years ago at the defeat at Majuba. They were accompanied by the 18th Hussars and a couple of hundred mounted infantry, and three batteries, the 13th, 67th and 69th, from the Royal Artillery, consisting of 18 field guns. More than enough to tackle any number of ragtag civilian farmers whom Pete Joubert might attack them with. It wouldn't be the last time in this war that the British completely underestimated their enemy, as you're about to find out, so stay tuned. Officers with more experience of South Africa had pointed out to Pensiman that his position at Dundee, and indeed that of General White at Ladysmith, was precarious. Both towns were in part of British territory that almost went up like a tunnel into Boer territory, and therefore they were actually surrounded on three sides by the Boer republics, and could therefore be easily surrounded. And that was exactly what the Boer commander, Pete Joubert, intended to do. He would advance with the main Boer army from the northwest, whilst a smaller Boer force of about 3,000 men under General Lucas Mayer would invade from the north. The strategy was for the two columns to converge just north of Dundee, sweeping round to cut off Simmons' line of retreat to Ladysmith and then turning on the heavily outnumbered British and defeat them in Dundee. Dawn on the morning of the 20th of October and the British garrison at Dundee were wakening to a damp, misty day. As the soldiers assembled on parade with full battle gear, one wag remarked that this was Scottish weather, just about what you'd expect from a town called Dundee, even in South Africa. At 5.40, in the growing light of day, men in the camp saw Boers on the crest of the 600-foot high Talana Hill, just beyond the town. Up on the hill, Captain Pretorius was moving his artillery, which consisted of two French Creusot field guns, a Krupp's quickfirer and a pom-pom gun that could fire 450 rounds a minute, into position to pound the British camp below. 600 feet below, General Penn Simmons was in his tent, easily recognisable to all around him by the large Union flag flying outside. He was just finishing a cigarette before breakfast, when a shell landed close by, embedding itself in the soft wet ground, but failing to, uh, to detonate. How impudent of the boars to start shelling before breakfast, he snapped. And he ordered his guns to return fire. Within half an hour, they'd silenced the Boer artillery. And the only British casualties from that Boer attack was a bugle boy, trumpeter horn, and a horse. The general now received word that the vanguard of Joubert's army, 2,000 men under General Daniel Erasmus, were beginning to occupy nearby Impati Hill and he decided he had to act swiftly to prevent Erasmus and behind him Joubert with the rest of the army from joining forces with the 3,000 men under Mayer on Talana Hill. The key was to remove Mayer's Boers from Talana Hill. And he decided on a classic three-phase battle to achieve this aim. Firstly, he would soften up the Boer positions with his artillery. Secondly, the infantry would charge the hill. And finally, his cavalry would move behind the hill to eliminate or capture the fleeing Boers. As the artillery, having repositioned themselves, started part one of Simmons' attack, three battalions of the infantry moved into place for part two. The attack would be carried out by the 2nd Royal Dublin Fusiliers, supported by the King's Royal Rifles, with the 1st Royal Irish Fusiliers forming the third line of attack. The 18th Hussars, under Lieutenant Colonel Moller, along with the mounted infantry, were ordered to ride around the western end of Talana Hill and use their initiative to attack the fleeing Boers. Major Knox, a veteran of the Camel Corps during the attempted relief of General Gordon in Khartoum, was ordered to take about 100 mounted men in between Talana and Lennox Hills to start to create a pincer movement to capture those fleeing Boers. It was a bold move by Simmons with one flaw. Moller lacked initiative, as you're going to find out 
in a while. Muller and his 200 cavalry of the 18th Hussars and the Mounted Infantry moved off into the swirling mists, and Simmons was never to see them again. If you enjoy my videos, then why not join my supporters club for even more videos, many of which are actually exclusive and not available on YouTube. For instance, uh, the Battle of Cable Street. I'll share the, a link with you at the end, plus there's also going to be a description below. Strangely, for a man who was authorising the cavalry to use initiative, Simmons stuck to conservative tried and tested methods for his infantry assault. He ordered them to advance up the 600 foot hill in close order, as if they were on parade at Aldershot. Tightly packed ranks, firing volleys, was the way the British won battles. And it worked when you were fighting masses of inferior armed enemies like the Zulus or the Sudanese. But this enemy were not inferior in weapons, nor were they charging wildly at the British lines. They were concealed at the crest of the hill, firing modern smokeless magazine rifles. And by the way, being mainly farmers, they were crack shots. By the time the Dublin Fusiliers had reached the base of the hill, they found themselves pinned down by highly accurate mouths of fire. Taking cover in some eucalyptus trees and also along a stone farm wall, the British advance came to a halt. As the King's Royal Rifles and the Irish Fusiliers joined them, bullets were ricocheting off the red volcanic boulders and were stripping the leaves of the eucalyptus trees, adding a sort of pungent eucalyptus smell to the aroma of cordite and the sounds of wounded men. For over an hour, Brigadier General James Yule, in charge of carrying out the assault, tried to move his men forward, but to no avail. Then at around 9am, through the drizzle, he saw the red pennant of General Penn Simmons coming towards him. The general seemed to be oblivious to the bullets whizzing past him. Riding on a horse with a man carrying a red flag ne next to him had strangely enough caught the attention of the Boers above. Reaching what remained of the eucalyptus grove, the general was urged by James Yule to postpone the assault until the artillery could pound the Boer positions a bit more. Penn Simmons was in no mood to delay. He was in a race against time to prevent those two Boer forces uniting. Mayer and his men had to be cleared off the hill. Period. He made his way to his troops and stepped through a gap in the wall, urging them forward, reminding the King's Royal Rifles that it was time to take revenge for Majuba. And it says a lot about the 66-year-old general that the infantry obeyed his exhortions and advanced. Having inspired the infantry to keep advancing, Penn Simmons mounted his horse and rode back towards his camp. He hadn't gone far when he hailed some Indian ambulance orderlies and requested their help. Unknown to his men, whilst he had been urging them forward, he had taken a bullet in his stomach and was mortally wounded. An hour later, the leading companies had reached the cover of another wall just below the summit of the hill. There, they fixed bayonets and they charged. Cresting the hill, they found that the Boers had silently abandoned their guns and had fled down the far side towards their horses. The British had won the first major battle of the war and the King's Royal Rifles had avenged Majuba. But as you know with my stories, there's always a bit more. And here it comes. Because at that moment of triumph, the Royal Artillery down below opened fire on the former Boer positions. As men were dropping around him, including one of his lieutenants who'd lost both his legs to British shrapnel, the commander of the King's Royal Rifles, Colonel Robert Gunning, raced to the crest of the hill and frantically waved to the guns below, shouting loudly, stop the firing! And eventually they did, but not before killing Colonel Gunning. With friendly fire adding to the casualties already inflicted on that close order advance up the uh, hill by the infantry, and with their general mortally wounded, what else could possibly go wrong today? Remember Lieutenant Colonel Muller and his cavalry, who had disappeared into the mists? Well, he'd earlier in the battle skirted the hill, as per his orders, and had actually seen all the Boer horses tethered at the rear of the mountain. One of his officers, Major Marling, a winner of the Victoria Cross in the campaign to save Gordon of Khartoum back in 1884, and a veteran of the First Boer War, urged him to capture the horses to prevent the Boers from fleeing. And this is where Muller's lack of initiative was to turn victory into a complete shambles. Whilst having never seen active service, he ignored Marling's advice and rode past, 
hoping to find a more suitable place to intercept the Boers when they finally fled the hill on their horses. Unfortunately, the mist that had been swirling around all morning returned, and he now got hopelessly lost. By the time the mist rose, Mayer's Boers were abandoning Talana Hill and were riding away into the distance. And worse still, Mola and his cavalry were nowhere near them. In fact, in their aimless amble in the mist, they had arrived at Adelaide Farm, right under the noses of General Erasmus's Boers on Impati Hill. Swiftly surrounded and after a short firefight, Muller and his entire command were captured by a 100-strong Irish Wheatlander Brigade fighting for the Boers, under the command of John McBride. McBride was later to be executed by the British for his participation in the 1916 Easter Rising. Mayer's 3,000 men were thus able to flee from Talana, brushing Knox and his 100 mounted men out of their way. I said that the British had won the Battle of Talana, so here's the scores on the doors. The Boers had been pushed off the hill and had lost nearly 200 men, killed or wounded, mainly from the artillery barrage. They'd also lost their guns, but more of that one later. The British had lost 51 men killed and 203 wounded the majority of whom were from the Royal Dublin Fusiliers, Irishmen fighting for the British Empire. They'd also lost 150 men from Muller's cavalry who had been humiliatingly captured by Irishmen fighting for the Boers. A poignant story concerns an officer from the Royal Dublin Fusiliers killed on the hill. Captain Weldon had been accompanied on the campaign by his terrier dog, Rose. And when a stretcher party found his body up on the hill, Rose was standing guard over it. Whilst they'd been cleared from Talana Hill, the Boers had escaped being encircled and were still in control of Impati Hill. And when the mist finally lifted the following day, Saturday the 21st of October, it was from that hill that they now proceeded to shell the British camp at Dundee using their long-range Long Tom gun. With General Penn Simmons mortally wounded in hospital, General Ruyul had taken over command and requested support from General White in Ladysmith. White, however, was now fighting his own battle against part of Joubert's army who had bypassed Dundee, and so he ordered General Yule to retreat and fall back on Ladysmith. At 10pm on the 22nd of October, just two days after their victory, I guess if you can call it that, the British garrison silently started their retreat through the dark night. And once more, just like at the Battle of Talana, it was raining. It would take them nearly three days to cover the 40 miles to Ladysmith. They left behind two months supplies for 5,000 men and all their wounded. General Yule had managed his departure so silently and the weather was so foul that the Boers were completely unaware that Dundee had been abandoned. And in the morning, Long Tom started shelling it all over again. It took uh, two medical officers to ride to Impati Hill carrying a white flag to bring the bombardment to a halt. Drifting in and out of consciousness, General Penn Simmons heard that Yule had abandoned the wounded and abandoned the camp at Dundee. He was appalled at the decision and muttered, I would never have done that. And from a man who was never afraid to lead from the front and who'd inspired his men to charge up Talana Hill through that deadly miles of fire and taken a bullet for his, for his efforts, I tend to believe him. His last words before dying that afternoon were, Tell everybody, I died facing the enemy. When the Boers arrived in Dundee, General Erasmus asked to pay his respects to the dead British general. And then he ordered Penn Simmons' body to be wrapped in a Union flag and buried at the local church. And as the body of the British commander passed along the streets, Boer soldiers took off their hats and many attended the funeral service. His body lies to this day in the cemetery at Dundee. The Battle of Talana was the first proper battle of the Second Boer War. Whilst a British victory, it had come at a huge cost. 51 British soldiers killed, including their commanding officer and a colonel, 203 wounded, 150 captured. It was a war that would drag on for another three years, costing the lives of 26,000 British soldiers and 6,000 Boer fighters. A further 26,000 Boer civilians would die in British concentration camps, along with nearly 20,000 black Africans. 
But it was a war that taught the British Army valuable lessons, which probably saved it from disaster during the very early stages of World War I. And the very first of those lessons was learned on the 20th of October, 1899, at Talana Hill, that the Boers were a very different enemy to those that the British had met in previous colonial wars. And they, the British, would need to adapt or die. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed that video and found the story interesting. Don't forget to give me a like and how about joining my History Chat Supporters Club? What's that all about? Well, click on the link that's going to appear in a moment. Loads more videos coming your way, but in the meantime, keep well and I'll see you very soon.